I'm a computer documentarian, that is, I shoot video and audio of old computers to be used as reference for emulator authors of today and historians of tomorrow. This guy behind me here is the IBM PC XT. It's a very recognizable computer, but it poses a bit of a problem for people like me, namely because of this. This is the IBM PC's internal speaker. It's a small 2-inch speaker, 8 ohms, puts out about 0.2 watts. This one in particular still has the assembly tag attached to it. You can not only see what IBM's official part number for it was, but also the date it was installed. IBM designed the motherboard to drive the speaker at either 5 volts or 0 volts, and connected to the 8253 timer on the motherboard, it could output a series of square waves, which would produce the characteristic IBM PC beep tone. In fact, it was known so much for just beeping that in Europe, the common name for this wasn't really the internal speaker, but the PC beeper. But throughout the life of the IBM PC, clever programmers figured out ways to get more than just square waves out of the PC speaker. By using tight assembler coding and bit banging the speaker port and other techniques, programmers were able to figure out how to reproduce very complicated sound effects, polyphonic music, and even the reproduction of sampled audio like speech. This unfortunately causes the aforementioned problem for me. All of these different methods have different output characteristics. Some are quiet and some are loud, so I'm not really sure what the best way to record them is. Do I put a microphone up to the speaker? Do I take the case off and put the microphone right next to the speaker? Do I tap the 5 volt lead and run it into a capture device to create a makeshift line in input? Uh, do I run the speaker through a sound card? Uh, some sound cards allowed that, and then do I record the output of the sound card? Or do I forget about the IBM PC completely and go with a system of that time period that did have a native output jack for the PC speaker? I don't know what the correct answer is. Uh, so we're going to do a series of experiments today to try to figure out what the best method overall is for recording the IBM PC speaker. I mentioned five methods in the intro just now, but we're actually going to cover seven methods, all of which don't require building an amplifier circuit or permanently modifying your hardware. Number one, record the good old-fashioned way by pointing a microphone directly at the speaker from outside the computer. Number two, point a microphone at the speaker, but with the case removed to get a clearer sound. Number three, record the speaker using binaural microphones. Binaural microphones sit inside your ear canal and record exactly what is heard. This is a 100% authentic listening experience through headphones, but may pick up more sound than we want. Number four, tap the five volt speaker lead directly. This is something Access promoted when they made real sound games. You connect one speaker lead to the center pole of a cable and the shielding to ground. For a link to building a cable, see the show notes in this video's description. Number five, route the speaker audio through a sound card using a cable, then record the sound card's output. Many sound cards allowed this, but you may have to build your own cable. Number six, simulate speaker audio without cables using a sound card. I've always been fascinated with the Pro Audio Spectrum's ability to do this. It has an 8253 timer chip on the card itself, which gets programmed using a copy of commands sent to the actual timer chip and speaker ports on the motherboard. It then uses the output of its own chip to provide the speaker audio. While this results in very clean output, it has some drawbacks, which we'll see later on. Number seven, abandon the IBM PC entirely and use another period appropriate system that does have output jacks. That essentially limits us to the IBM PC Junior and the Tandy 1000, but we can't use the IBM PC Junior because the first 128K of RAM in the PC Junior is too slow, so that leaves us with the Tandy 1000. Will it produce the same results as a real IBM PC? As for what kind of audio to test with, there were at least 2,000 games that output through the speaker using dozens of different methods. Using my decades of experience in this area, I've come up with 12 different sound tests that cover most regular and exotic methods people are likely to come across. They are, very quickly, silence, the system beep, a single voice melody, simple sound effects, arpeggiated music, multi-voice music using pulse waves, music construction set, one-bit PCM audio, pulse width modulation with an audible carrier wave, pulse width modulation with a faint carrier wave, pulse width modulation at high frequencies, and for a little bonus, pulse width modulation output of wavetable music. We need a consistent method to compare these, so I'll present each of these samples one at a time, rolling through each capture method. 
This should make it easy to compare which method is best for each source. To ensure a fair comparison, as well as prevent blowing out your ears, I'll calibrate each capture method to the sound of the system beep at negative 12 decibels. But despite this, some sections might sound harsh over headphones, so be sure to adjust your listening volume to a comfortable level. To keep track of our results, I'll use a simple scoring system. Good methods will score one point, merely okay methods won't score anything, and bad methods will get a point taken away. At the end of our testing, we'll tally up the results and see if any obvious winners emerge. Let's start with silence. This may seem silly, but think about it. Your PC spends most of its time not making sound, so any capture method that picks up audible levels of background noise during silent periods is unacceptable. We'll use a few seconds of silence to observe the noise floor of each recording method. The system beep. The traditional system bell predates the IBM PC by decades. On old teletypes, it was actually a physical bell. It's represented in ASCII by character number 7, or control G. The IBM PC BIOS uses a PIT divisor of 533 hex when making the beep, which results in an 896 hertz tone. A single voice melody. This is the most common music you'd hear on a PC in the early 1980s, like something out of a basic program. Rather than use a basic play statement, I've chosen the famous Baroque piece Minuet in G Major, as transcribed by an educational music program called Songwriter. Simple sound effects. Sound effects are performed by changing the speaker's square wave output frequently, as high as 120 times per second or more. I've chosen Commander Keen 4 as the source material for this as an easily recognizable example.
arpeggiated music. Polyphonic music was commonly simulated by switching between the notes of a chord very quickly, from 60 to 120 times per second. This technique is pushed to the limit in Shiru's System Beeps music disc from 2019, so I've chosen a small segment of music from that album. All these methods so far use the 8253 timer chip as designed. From here on out, we'll choose more CPU-intensive methods of sound generation that didn't exactly play by the book. Multi-voice music using pulse waves. First heard on the PC in the windmill game Digger, this method of sound generation was very popular on the ZX Spectrum line of computers, and the method was sometimes carried over when those games were ported to the IBM PC. To illustrate this technique, I've chosen the title music from Fantastic Dizzy. Music Construction Set. This is a very unique four-voice engine that allows for some voices to sound more dominant than others. I chose this because it was the first example of an IBM PC deliberately trying to be a polyphonic musical instrument, and also because this particular engine is significantly louder than other engines. one-bit PCM audio. This was a common homebrew project to build in the 1980s, and was used by many games. The output is very loud, which is good, but suffers from high distortion. In this example, the author of the homebrew project counts off some numbers.
pulse width modulation with an audible carrier wave. Pulse width modulation reproduces sampled audio very clearly through the speaker, but also produces a secondary tone that matches the rate of playback. At lower playback rates, this results in a nasty, annoying audible carrier wave. One of the most annoying examples of this is the opening theme to Crazy Cars. Pulse width modulation with a faint carrier wave. Using pulse width modulation to reproduce speech was the most common use case of Access Software's real sound technology, and you can hear this with a faint carrier wave in all of their real sound games. Our example is some speech during gameplay from World Class Leaderboard Golf. Looks like he hit the tree, Jim. 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 Pulse width modulation at high frequencies. When pulse width modulation was used at very high rates, the carrier wave became inaudible, resulting in very crisp, clear audio. Our example is the opening of World Class Leaderboard Golf. Pulse width modulation output of wavetable music. This was only used to date in one program, so it's a little bit of a bonus, but it sounds pretty cool and it also puts some of our sound methods to the test. The wavetable mixing engine in the award winning demo 8088 miles per hour uses pulse width modulation techniques for output, however, it doesn't use the traditional two timer channels technique, which might cause a problem for some of our methods.
So it's been a few weeks since I recorded all of those samples. I wanted to wait a while and then listen to them again with a fresh set of ears. And I went ahead and filled out the sheet as I said I would. And what I'd like to do now is go over every item in the sheet and tell you how I ranked everything. Now, my needs are probably different than a lot of other people's needs. For example, I need to set up a recording station and leave it that way for several days or weeks. Whatever the solution is, it can't be bulky or take up a lot of room or be fragile. Um, second of all, authenticity is absolutely paramount to me. So if the recording method alters the sound in some way or doesn't work with all methods, it's not going to work for me personally. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and check out the sheet and I'll explain how I ranked everything and why. So for silence, some of the things to consider are, are you connecting the PC speaker to an amplified speaker setup so that you can have something set up all the time to hear it while you're playing games or something like that? If so, you probably don't want a lot of EMI or RFI noise in the background. You may have noticed during the samples, I was going through autoexec.bat, we saw things happening, and that was intentional. That was to provide the computer something irregular to do, so that if it was generating any noise that was audible in the output, we would hear it. And unfortunately, we did hear it in tapping the speaker leads directly and in the sound card with a cable, which is why I scored those lower. When it came to ambient system noise, miking the speaker in all cases provided some noise, but I felt that the binaural mics was the worst, so I scored that low. And uh, the sound card without a cable, the Pro Audio Spectrum, was a, a little bit of a, of a disappointment. There was low-level hiss in the background, I'm guessing due to the amplifier it has on, on board or something. It could also be due to the fact that the board is 25 years old and maybe some of the surface mount capacitors are starting to go bad. I don't know. And unfortunately, I did not do these tests 25 years ago when the card was new. So I can't go back in time and figure that out. And the surprise winner for this was the Tandy 1000. There is no noise on the output at all. That was shocking. So uh, surprising results there. Uh, let's move on to the system beep. Now, when I was devising the test for the system beep, I was telling about this experiment with some of my friends and they suggested um, rather than bother trying to come up with a subjective opinion on which method was best, why not just simply grab the waveform and see how exact it is to an actual square wave and uh, look at it in both a waveform display and also in a frequency sweep display to see how it looks. And I thought about that and I almost put that in the video. And then I realized that a pure square wave, exactly pure, is not necessarily a good thing to measure against for this test because the sound of the speaker can be affected by a whole bunch of things, including bouncing off of the inside of the case or being shaped by the room or something like that. And so aiming for a pure square wave tone may not necessarily be what we want. Now, that's an opinion. If you disagree with it, I, I certainly encourage you to go out and do these tests yourself. Try miking the speaker, try tapping the speaker leads, uh, use a sound card, whatever. Bring it up for yourself in some audio editor like um, Audacity or Audition or something like that. Take a look at it yourself. If that's important to you, if getting the purest square wave possible is important to you, by all means, please research it. So looking at how I scored the system beep, um, just some quick notes. I rated the sound card with the cable and the sound card without a cable higher because I felt that they produced the brightest image without it being too bright or too crispy. I feel that the sound cards may have rolled off some of the frequencies and it, it appealed to me the most. And as for the rest, it's mostly not notable except for the Tandy 1000, which failed the system beep test completely. Um, they use a completely different tone and duration for the system beep. And like I said, authenticity is important to me. So that's why I didn't rank it highly. Okay, moving on to a single voice melody. This is very subjective. If you've used an emulator more than you've used a real machine, you may prefer the brightest sound possible, and in which case that would probably, in my opinion, be the sound card without a cable. That, that onboard 8253 on the Pro Audio Spectrum does a, a great job there. In terms of the rest, it's totally subjective, and I have a surprise winner here in that I thought uh, miking the speaker with the case off sounded the truest to me. All of the sound card options and the Tandy 1000 were quite acceptable. So if you want a brighter sound, maybe go with the Pro Audio Spectrum. And if you want something maybe a little more rounded, go with the sound card with a cable or the Tandy 1000. I thought the tapping the speaker leads produced too hot of a signal somehow. So that's why I ranked it badly. 
So let's cover simple sound effects. This was a little difficult for me to score because some of the stuff I thought I would like was marred by something else. For example, the Tandy 1000 had excellent output, but the speed was just ever so slightly off. I don't know why that is. I just left it neutral because I couldn't tell. This was a test of more of like, I, I didn't know necessarily which one was the winner, but I definitely knew which ones were the losers. Uh, the binaural mics, of course, are pretty much losing all of these. Tapping the speaker leads had way too much background noise. You can actually hear the computer going through the screen refresh in the background. And a uh, sound card with a cable, I felt like there were a couple of sounds that were a little too fuzzy or overdriven or crunchy. I don't know why that is, but so that's why I ranked it lower. Honestly, I liked the sound of miking the speaker with the case off the best, so that's why it has the only positive note for me. So for arpeggiated music, I felt that the best solution would be the one that produced the brightest overall sound. When I listen to music through a PC speaker, I want it to retain the bass, and I also want it to sound clean and bright. And for that, I felt that tapping the speaker leads and also using a sound card with no cable produced the brightest overall sound. The Tandy 1000 and the sound card with the cable seemed to kind of mute the sound a bit, and I wasn't happy about that. It felt like it, I had run it through some sort of a filter when of course I hadn't. The miked solutions sounded pretty good, but I felt there was too much of a loss of bass, which is why I kind of scored them neutrally. Now, you would want to pick a miked version if you were trying to create Foley or ambient sound for something that you're trying to get authentic in an open room scenario, like for example, a movie or a TV show or something, that is probably what you want. But for me, I want to represent the music as best I can, so I scored the brighter options higher. Now for the pulse wave music, there's really no way to say this kindly, it just is terrible all around. The only saving grace I think of some of these recording methods is that they try to either cut down the noise so that you hear the natural fuzzing of this method, uh, or they try to uh, represent it as bright as possible. So, not surprisingly, I kind of scored this exactly the same way I did the arpeggiated music, although I felt the miking the speaker with the case off higher because that's kind of true to life if you're sitting in front of the system. On an IBM PC, it's, it's a little faint due to the nature of the method, but uh, if you can amplify it or if you're working with a system that, that does have a louder speaker, that's actually what it sounds like. So that's how I scored that. But in general, pulse wave music, kind of sucks. Now a music construction set is near and dear to my heart, so a lot of these scorings that I did are, I'm gonna have to say, subjective. And in fact, they conflict with each other, so this is probably my most uh, inconsistent scoring, and uh, you may want to take these numbers with a grain of salt. Miking the speaker with the case off sounds truest to me, to how it sounds when you're right in front of it. The sound card using a cable rolled off the frequencies a bit and made it a little less harsh, but it also made it less bright, and the sound card without a cable made it brighter. And this one is all over the map, I can't explain myself, I guess you could say I couldn't even really decide between which one was the best, so I scored them all very well. Now the 1-bit PCM is a technique that I put in here because it is very interesting. It is the only example of producing uh, sampled or digitized sound through the speaker that is really loud. Uh, for this, the miking the speaker with the case off produced the clearest sound, so I gave it a 1, and in the only win for the binaural mics, I gave it a 1 there as well, because when you're sitting right in front of the computer, it is that loud, and uh, it's surprising. And so I felt that the binaural mics actually was the most correct representation of what 1-bit PCM audio actually sounds like. Now we're moving on to the pulse wave modulation methods, and the name of the game there is carrier wave. Can you hear it? The nature of this method generates a carrier wave at the sampling frequency that you're playing back. And in some methods you can hear it, in some methods you can't. About the only one that seemed to sound decent to me was uh, the Sound Blaster using a cable, the sound card with a cable, because Whatever filtering it's doing, it seems to be filtering out the carrier wave. I don't know if it's intentional or unintentional, but it sounded the best. Uh, surprisingly, the Tandy 1000 sounded pretty good, but it was the wrong speed. 
uh, one of the surprising things about these tests was that it demonstrated to me, I was under the misconception that the Tandy 1000 was exactly, exactly the same speed as the IBM PC. They both used a 4.77 megahertz 8088 CPU. And it turns out in both this test and in a later test, it's not exactly the same speed. It's a little bit slower. And you can hear that even if it's only 1%, you can actually hear that. So pulse width modulation for terrible sound sources with a terrible carrier wave, sound card with a cable wins. So moving on to pulse width modulation with a faint carrier wave. This was exactly the use case for real sound. This was the most common frequency real sound produced. Real sound wasn't the only name of the game here when it came to pulse width modulation, but this particular example is probably the quintessential use case of it. And a lot of methods did really well here. And I think, honestly, some of the sound cards, maybe the sound card without the cable specifically, might have been um, engineered with this in mind. All the sound card options sound really good. The Tandy 1000 uh, also sounds really good. Since it uses interrupts to produce this method of sound generation, it was the correct speed. The interrupts are actually what are governing the speed in this case, so it wasn't slower. And the truest sound uh, was miking the speaker with the case off. So a lot of winners here and uh, what you decide sounds best is up to you. It's subjective and it's for your specific application. Pulse width modulation at high frequencies was limited to only a few games because it was too much sound data per second to put on the discs. A few real sound games used sound that high, but for the most part, where you're really gonna hear pulse width modulation at a high frequency consistently is something like a mod player that outputs through the PC speaker. Now, this particular use case is the original IBM PC. It's too slow to run a mod player outputting through the speaker, so we have to go with games. And all of these sounded pretty good, but you'll notice I scored the sound card without the cable the highest, and that's because I felt it represented the sound most authentically. In fact, so authentically that I heard for the first time listening to this sample through this card, the sound of somebody breathing. You can hear it too if you want to go back in the video. I guess whoever recorded the sound of all these birds was right next to the microphone and they were breathing. So uh, you can actually hear that on the sound card without the cable, the Pro Audio Spectrum. And the only negative goes to the Tandy 1000, which somehow introduces an audible carrier wave. No idea what's going on there. Probably an aliasing between the, DM, the DRAM refresh and the, on the Tandy 1000 and the actual replay rate. I don't know. I didn't look into it. All I know is that it sounds bad and that's why I scored it low. Now we come to the uh, bonus round, as it were, uh, pulse width modulation using an atypical technique. The typical technique for outputting pulse width modulated audio was using both uh, pit timer channel zero and two, zero to pace the samples and two to set their amplitude. Prior to, let's say, 1987 uh, and before, Programmers didn't really have that technique down, so they typically did it um, the way you would do it with an Apple II or a ZX Spectrum. You would do it all through software timing loops, so no timer channels were used. For both of those applications, the Pro Audio Spectrum, the sound card with no cable, was able to reproduce those very well. Unfortunately, with the method introduced in 8088 miles per hour, where we only use timer channel two, the Pro Audio Spectrum couldn't output anything at all. And that's a little sad to me because I was kind of hoping that it would. I thought it was doing a great job thus far. So I had to give it poor marks for that. The Tandy 1000, another surprise loser actually in this. Again, I didn't realize the Tandy 1000 was just a fraction of a percent slower than the PC. And you would never notice it, but when you play audio using a very tightly controlled technique, you can hear it, and the Tandy 1000 is audibly slower than the IBM PC with these other methods, so I had to give that poor marks. So what did I give good marks to? Uh, so the sound card with the cable I felt produced the best overall frequency roll off it. I think it had the least amount of noise. And miking the speaker with the case off I gave high marks to because honestly that's kind of how we were intending it to sound when we were developing it. So when we look at all the results aggregated, what comes out as best? Surprisingly, miking the speaker with the case off, I felt, sounded the best. It sounded truest to how the speaker actually sounds, because it is the actual speaker. And surprisingly, I, it has the least amount of noise. Now, I wondered why that was until I went back and actually looked at the video instead of just listening to it. And it's because there are several add-in cards in the system in between the noisy power supply and the speaker. So I think it sounds the truest to life. 
Uh, I don't really want to leave my IBM PC out for weeks at a time with the cover off. And uh, also, miking the speaker is kind of annoying. It's a hassle uh, to either change the batteries in the field recorder or take the memory card out and transfer things over. I didn't really like that solution in general. So for me, it's going to be one of the sound card solutions and uh, it's probably going to be the Pro Audio Spectrum, even though I said that it was um, a little noisy in silence, and it is. Um, honestly, I'm not going to be worried about that too much because most of my captures will go through some sort of audio post-processing and I can address the noise that way. And it's certainly better than the noise provided by the Sound Blaster with the cable because that picks up a ton of internal system noise, so much so that I felt it was distracting. Um, yes, the Pro Audio Spectrum can't reproduce 88.8 miles per hour, but there are enough videos of that floating around that I think I'm okay with that. So those are my summary results. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Did I make a couple of incorrect judgments? Uh, did I have some sort of an error in my scientific method and sampling of all of these uh, audio processes? Or do you think that this is a complete and utter waste of time? Whatever you have to say, I'd like to know, so please uh, leave a comment below. And thanks for watching. Thank you.